Welcome to Beppe Presents. Birth and Early Parenting Educators is an alliance of professionals interested in and focused on the first period of human development from conception to birth and breastfeeding. This is a dramatically important aspect of human development, perhaps the most important time for human beings in their development. And this is because we've learned recently that the baby in the womb is extraordinarily sensitive and vulnerable and open and communicative as we were never able to know before. And we want to get the message of, the, of, this new, of these new discoveries out to parents so they can benefit from them as soon as possible. This program you're about to see is one in a series of programs that we've prepared for you, which we hope will be very fascinating and illuminates this period of human development. You're perfectly, perfect. that I'm trying to get them to see birth as beautiful. I feel that I benefited enormously from practicing yoga and that my birth was relatively easy because of my yoga practice. To come together, raise our intention to shift the paradigm of childbirth. When they have an opportunity to come here and settle and relax and hone in to their own baby, it's really powerful. In this day and age, it's, it is a powerful opportunity for mamas. So that's a baby song. So I'm Lori Chamberlain and I am a birth professional. I teach hospital childbirth classes and home birth childbirth classes. I teach prenatal breastfeeding classes. <laughs> you again, you are smart. So this is a breast model. All the pregnant women in this class actually have some colostrum in their breasts right now. It is loaded with antibodies. So all the colds that you've had in your life, or maybe when they nurse the first few days, they get loaded with all those antibodies. Women that are coming to my childbirth classes who've had subsequent children, usually what happens is lights go off during the class. I didn't know that the first time around. If I would have known that, maybe I would have had a different experience. And. That's one of the biggest motivators for me. I hate hearing women say, if I would have known that. So that's what I'm trying to give them in the childbirth classes. Here's the information you need to know to navigate this terrain so that you can have a good experience. One of the most interesting things that I see when I meet with people interviewing me to be their doula is they're coming to just find out about doulas and she really wants a doula and actually he wants a doula too, but they're afraid to tell each other because she's afraid that if she says she wants a doula, she's gonna make him feel left out. 
And he's afraid if he admits that he wants a doula that he doesn't know everything about labor and birth. But when they can both actually say that they both want to do it, it takes a lot of pressure off of everybody. They don't know until labor actually starts how happy they are to have a doula there. Usually the dad is so relieved I can see in his face when the doula walks in. Oh gosh, you know, what a relief. The, the dads have a lot of pressure on them to, to know a lot. And the, do, the dad is the one that actually knows the laboring woman better than anybody. And the doula knows the birth practices. So the team of those two together really helps support the laboring woman. And in the doula training that I took and some of the premier doula trainings, one of the main functions of the doula is to show the dad how to support the laboring mom. And so it is a myth that the doula will come in and take over and replace the dad. That's not the role of the doula at all. I had been in training for body work, doing Lomi body work. Um, and we were, it was like a very intense training. You know, it was, you know, three and a half months, 12 hours a day, five to six days a week. It was very intense. And we were doing gestalt, we were doing body work, we were doing psychic work. Um, we were doing Reiki and breath work, all this different stuff. <clears throat> and I was a week into that when I found out I was pregnant. So I went through my first trimester doing all this stuff, an hour meditation every day as I always started out. And what happened was when I had my baby, I had a posterior presentation. And those are your really long labors. But because of what I had learned through the body work during my pregnancy, I used some of those techniques and had an 11 hour labor. I worked with gravity. I did what's called active laboring, where I was up doing postures and working with gravity, you know, and, and that really worked. And, you know, I mean, this should have been a 40 hour labor. It was 11. So I was telling one of my friends about that after the baby had been born and she was pregnant and she said, teach me how to do it. So that's where my classes kind of came from that. And, and so my classes are really, um, my childbirth classes are very body oriented. And also because I have a master's in psychology and have worked a lot in counseling and psychology, I brought in the whole uh, emotional side of it. Counseling is, is very powerful and it's where I'd like to focus most of my energy right now because in our culture, pregnant women are surrounded by lots of stories from well-meaning friends and co-workers and the women around her, but usually the stories that she gets to hear are stories that other laboring women haven't processed yet, and so sometimes they're not the most inspiring stories. And so the pregnant women walk around carrying all these stories of fear. And so when they come into the prenatal counseling and they're able to sit with somebody who's trained in birth, they can process this and start letting go of the fear of this and that and the other so that when labor starts they're not holding back in their labor because of fear of what happened to their brother's sister's friend's wife they can just allow the process to happen naturally the story that illustrates it to me that happened recently was uh, a, a woman came in for the prenatal counseling and she was quite humorous. She could have been a comedian. And it was hard to sort of grasp, grasp her because she dealt with her fear with humor. Um, so she had some real fears about labor coming up. And we talked about them specifically. One by one, we went down the list of what was scaring her. And the next, following week, I ran into her and her husband in town. and. She excused herself for a minute, and her husband said, I don't know what you did, but when she came home, that was the very first time that she was ever actually excited about giving birth. I've been working with women and their families around the childbirth process since 1973, when I gave birth to my own daughter. I believe that the birth of a baby is the birth of family. And the definition of family has been changing dramatically in the, in the last 30 years. 
the cultural stress, therefore, is very high for women giving birth today in terms of being able to put together an identity as mother in a way that feels supported by society, by the family structure, and safe. Our traditional medical care has addressed the needs of women through an increase in technology. However, the technology itself often exacerbates the emotional stress that women are experiencing during this period. Body-centered hypnosis works on the mind as well as the body and is a sort of soft technology, if you will, which addresses the emotional concerns that are coming up for women today. Body-centered hypnosis creates a memory tracing in the body of the imagery and suggestions being given. And it's done through tonality, through phrasing, through other techniques that you'll be able to identify in the tape, such that the woman has an experience of the birth process already encoded that can be utilized when the actual birth occurs. It's like the taste of a lemon. You know, you can taste a lemon at one time in your life, and then merely remembering the taste of a lemon reactivates the nervous system in such a way that you actually respond with the same physical sensations as if a lemon were in your mouth. I use symbols and imagery as well as vocal intonation to implant suggestions which will fulfill themselves over time. So the sense of containment, of maintaining and sustaining the pregnancy, of enclosure, is facilitated for a woman who would be threatening premature labor. The sensation for the baby's head, very heavy, right down on the cervix, is evoked for a woman who would have a breech presentation. What we do in the class, first we've done a little meditation, which drops them down. Okay, relaxes them, gets rid of all the mind chatter, all the stuff it took to get here. We get them into this drop down, relaxed position. And then we just talk about opening into that baby. And just whatever comes up, take the first thing that comes up and don't worry about it. There's no right or wrong here. And so it's basically teaching them how to access their own inner knowingness by just getting still and going in and opening and just trusting what you get. And knowing there's, the, the biggest thing I think for women is knowing there's not a right or wrong answer. There is not. And sometimes women are blank and that's great too. It's like, okay, the babies aren't talking tonight. No problem, you know? So that's, it's kind of a training in how to get down and access that place inside every one of us that knows all there is to know. And when you know how to drop into that, it can be a very, very powerful tool you can use your whole life. Our methods inv uh, involve a um, vivid uh, engagement with the child in the womb. If they're done pre for preconception, in terms of preparing for birth, for conscious childbirth, um, and one, and the couple uh, envisions uh, the child in the womb already, um, uh, they become good methods for that, for conscious conception. I'll briefly describe the three methods to you. Um, we could say that the central method is called womb breathing. Womb breathing is based on uh, a classic method of meditation science that has been uh, central to Tai Chi, Qi Kung, Hindu yoga, Buddhist yoga for centuries. Uh, probably uh, well-tested, well-refined, well-developed over a thousand years. And uh, in all these yogas, there is um, a, uh, a clear knowledge that we have the ability to breathe vital energy from the air, called chi or prana, down into a facility in the energy body uh, centered between four fingers above the navel and four fingers below the navel, just lit in the energy center in the energy body. 
So historically, historically, primarily men have been engaged in these meditation practices and great meditation lineages around the world. And they have been for, for their own development and for vitality and longevity and, and uh, evolution. Uh, uh, learning to breathe energy from the air until it's almost a secondary function, or it is a secondary function. The body loves to do this because the body was made to do this. So throughout history, this has been a, a, uh, a central practice of meditation science in different cultures of the world. Women were not directed to do this practice, even though it was breathing into the navel center, which is where the womb is. And, uh, but occasionally throughout history, particularly in the lineage of uh, Tibetan Vajrayana, uh, the Vajrayana Tibetan Buddhist lineage that I was trained in, women did practice this method almost equally with men. And uh, bringing the center of, gravity, center of gravity of intensive functioning down into the navel center and breathing vital energy down into the navel center. And if they happened to be pregnant, they knew they were doing some extraordinary form of prenatal care with, with great developmental potential to it. The other half is that the mind is constantly shifting. And I had spent uh, 10 years uh, training in Vipassana meditation, Shamatha Vipassana, with Trungpa Rinpoche. And I knew that the psychological method of uh, being able to know the difference between mind and awareness and to intentionally shift from mind to awareness to, to all, as if uh, in that 10 years of work I could constantly see that all my life I had been giving all my force to my mind. And by being trained into the nature of awareness, I was given a method for shifting the power back from the mind to awareness where intuition, direct knowing, and different kinds of function are. And uh, you could see it as a revolution, a shift of power from mind to awareness. And so I had been doing that for a long time. I had been doing that intensively for 10 years, and that's the same kind of meditation that is used throughout the American medical system uh, based on the tremendous success of the program at the Me uh, University of Massachusetts Medical Center, where more than 18,000 people at this point have trained in mindfulness meditation, which is essentially Vipassana, which is essentially based on distinguishing between mind and awareness and shifting function, the psychophysical shift from mind to awareness. And one of the things they learned through the decades of uh, work with people with intolerable levels of pain, cancer patients, AIDS patients, people with damaged nervous systems, they proved cogently that this kind of meditation based on distinguishing between mind and awareness was a major pain management method for people that uh, they were afraid to give more medication to uh, for killing them with over-applying medita medication or people that they were afraid to do more surgery to. This non-invasive method of, of being able to distinguish between mind and awareness, to know the nature of suffering and to know the nobility or the courage, uh, fearlessness of staying in present moment pain. That's one of the great achievements of the University of Massachusetts Medical Center program and the five to 700 programs that it spawned uh, throughout the Western world. Uh, when you take this uh, ability to breathe vital energy down into the navel center and you put and you use it in conjunction with the psychological method to shift from mind to awareness you have an inspiring reason to stay in the presence of awareness and do this transformative breathing breathing tr doubly transformative in the womb breathing method you are uh, 
it's transformative with respect to what is breathing because you're, you're breathing both with the energy body and the physical body. And this is a complete kind of breathing and quite profound breathing. It's not only abdominal breathing, so you're getting complete oxygenation, <clears throat> but you're breathing into the energy body with a transformative sense of the body. And it's really, uh, when you apply this to childbirth, obviously there are several things going on at once to, you know, uh, to, to make a concise presentation of this method. In the first place, there's been a problem with respect, with respect to respect of women's bodies uh, for a long time. Women have been asked to have their bodies corseted for hundreds of years and they've been looked at as bodies for a long time. And there's a lot of image uh, uh, problem with respect to the body. And, and there's in general a vast, dis women have experienced a vast disempowerment for many reasons, which probably you both know. And also a sense of disrespect for their body and a sense of, of a lack of confidence for the function in childbirth. And thereby we have more than 90% of the women today opting for drugs or, and uh, surgery or, uh, for many factors. Anyhow, the sense of the body as an energy body is an ennobling, empowering sense of the body and may inspire women to do the right thing. I think babies choose how they're going to come in. And I, and I tell this to moms because so many women that end up with C-sections for whatever reason feel like they've done something wrong, there's something wrong with them, they didn't do it right, and that's not necessarily the case at all. Babies do have a piece of choosing how they're coming in. It's, it's a co-creation. You know, Gifted. yeah, it's just, it's fun. And you know, I always in there, and again, this was just one of those intuitive things, taught the women how to connect into the babies. I still teach that. So every week when we have a class, after we do a meditation, which is actually ocean breathing, it's a Bradley breathing, then we have them connect into the baby and ask, see if they can pick up uh, some kind of quality or characteristic of who this is. And then we ask them to ask the baby if there's anything that the baby needs. And then we ask them to go and ask their higher self what they might need. And, um, and then we share that in the group. And so what we're doing is working with the women, learning how to connect into that baby now while in utero so we can set that bonding up now. The other thing is, is that when we're in labor, if I need some information, like for instance, I had one woman who was, who was um, gonna, she wanted a natural birth so bad, she was 18, and it was her dream to have a natural birth. And she, you know, she labored for like 12 hours and nothing happened. And she, she got to, well, she got to eight centimeters, but stuck there for another 12 hours and nothing was happening and she was in the hospital and the doctors were talking about C-section and she did not want to go there. And I said, okay, I want you to go in and ask the baby what is needed. And what she got was, I need to come out and I need to come out now. And so when she got that information, she went, okay, we'll do the C-section. So they did the C-section. Turned out that, that that baby's head was not going to come through that pelvis. And the baby had bruising on the top of the head from where the head was hitting the pelvic bone. So the baby did need to come out and it did need to come out now, you know. So that's the, the um, importance of women learning how to, how to get that, that access to that baby now, you know, so that they, that they, and then you use it from then on. I mean, once the baby's out, when the baby is really fussy and, you know, you don't know how to comfort the baby, you go in and you go underneath that crying and you ask what's needed. And so they already have that skill. Alrighty. Hey Bradley, there you are. You think he's gonna have blonde hair? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I was blonde as a baby and so is Jason. Yeah, I think. We both have blue eyes, so I think it's gonna be fair skinned with blue eyes. Yeah. 
one of the things, um, it's not so much my intuition that I want to bring out. I want to bring out the mother's intuition. I want to strengthen her intuition. I, a lot of body people are just intuitive. It's how we are. I, I'll massage a lot of times with my eyes closed just to feel. But the powerful thing is, is when um, the mother can go, I mean, um, for instance, Jennifer knows her, what color her baby's going to be, blonde hair, blue eyes, and, you know, she has that connection. And when a mom, a lot of times I'll do Reiki and I'll find trying to bring her center in with the baby's center. And, you know, you get re remarkable results with that where I had moms to say, um, through that treatment, I've seen my baby exactly how it came out. And that's, to me, powerful. Mm -hmm. Because we're working with the mother's psyche, the mother's intuition. And when we're doing that, we're empowering the mother. And that is the main thing that I want to do. Yeah. Yeah, it's not me. It's not the doctor. It's not the midwives. It's not the professionals. It's the mother who is in charge. She's the one who's raising this baby and that is really you know that's what we need here go ahead and turn your head this way that's that right. lasts for a lifetime right it's their relationship right and as you well know is when you have a positive birth experience you can carry those on to other times in your life when the child's life where there may be a crisis and you can tap into that time of empowerment that you had in birth and those things are so, that's, that's needed. We need that. Absolutely. So. It's different from regular massage to prenatal massages. How do we position a mother? The support of the mother's body is very important. You wouldn't lay a mother in her second trimester and her third trimester on her back. That would prevent um, her to um, bring blood to her to her womb and there's a vena cava that goes right down into the uterus so what we want to do what we're conscious of doing is making sure that her um, the weight the extra weight she gets from the baby is not so much compounded in her body so we bring bolsters like this one and this one which I have right here to help support her weight and Jennifer how do you feel comfortable yeah she said comfortable. 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 You're right. She's comfortable because in the sense that her joints, her, her leg is not mashing down. She's working on her sciatica. It's getting better. It has, you had about a week of, you felt like it was improving and then came back again within a week. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Twice a week. <laughs> no, I want to get you into, into <laughs> yoga too. So one of the things that when I was trained was to bring movement and, and room to the mother for when the baby is growing. So we do certain stretches that um, give me a good breath and this is one of the things we do. Release. And just a stretch right like that. And you can see how the, kind of like an accordion effect there. And again, another good stretch. We have to be careful with a pregnant woman at the same time because of the relaxing. We're not to stretch them too much. One more good breath. Also, um, the reflexology. Mm. We're working everywhere we can to help with mamas. One of the things we can work with reflexology is sometimes mamas get constipated. Mm -hmm. So the feet is a good place to work with that. Um, circulatory is you're getting the blood moving you know you have extra blood in the body that um, when the um, woman is pregnant she, she has about half as much more blood so that again is using that part working with the neck area trying to get the neck and aligned and so forth one thing the benefits for babies is that um, when a mama is taking care of themselves and consciously taking care of themselves, it, it in a way teaches the babies to also be aware that, hey, there's, you know, there's a connection. 
Um, it gives a chance for mamas to relax and um, uh, be relax and also center onto the baby. So that's again a benefit for the baby. It also helps to release the toxins from the uterus to flush that out and you know bring in healthy blood cells for the baby so it helps with the growth process. So taking a nice deep inhale through the nose. Mm -hmm. from the extremities um, to release that tension from the extremities and draw it up the spinal cord and into the brain. And that's how you produce more peace, more happiness. That's how you achieve what they ultimately call samadhi. Um, and the interesting thing was that as soon as I got pregnant, all of that upward energy that I had cultivated suddenly was heading back down. <laughs> And so for the first trimester of my pregnancy, I really just succumbed to that downward energy. Uh, I really sank into the couch and <laughs> I ate the ice cream and worried a lot. Uh, because I, it felt selfish to try to draw that energy up when it was so clearly needed down in my womb with my baby. And so then I started practicing prenatal and realized, no, in fact, the more energy that you can cultivate up here, the better off your baby is going to be. Um, and you don't really need to know any of those um, specific or technical details about yoga to benefit from it. But I started attending yoga right around my second trimester, prenatal yoga, and I found that I could still cultivate that upward energy and, you know, still, <laughs> still be gestating. <laughs> so, um, and I, it was like one big science experiment for me in terms of just awareness of what my body was doing. After my baby was born, I had the opportunity to start teaching and I was very excited about it because I really wanted to relay some of that information to other women who were pregnant, uh, especially women who are having their first baby. Uh, because if you're not familiar with how the whole thing works, it's, it feels like an enormous, overwhelming mystery regularly. Okay. Are you done nursing? Inhaling, drawing up to center, and exhaling, other side. Miranda's yoga class is fabulous for prenatal. Um, it helps open your body, open your spirit to the little spirit that's inside, mm -hmm. and uh, she really helps us connect with the baby and makes it a practice for both of us, and that's really special during the pregnancy. Sounding Ma really brings you into touch with the ancient motherhood, you know, and with with the feeling of really connecting with that, you know. Before you're pregnant, before I was pregnant, I didn't, it was hard for me to connect with that idea of that real deep motherhood, and then when you're there, and being able to sound it and realize it before the child is with you, I don't know, it kind of, you like a ta yeah, you really um, connect with that deep mother spirit. Helped me connect with that a lot. I am due in about a week and a half. I had a yoga practice before becoming pregnant, so it felt really natural to continue with yoga. My regular yoga class got harder for me, so it was really nice to find a prenatal class that was designed for women who are pregnant. And I've been in the prenatal yoga class probably for the last maybe four months practicing with Miranda. Um, 
It's been great. It's an opportunity for me to slow down and just drop, drop into my body, which I really appreciate. Um, and I think just the breath work and some of just sort of the, the being is going to be really helpful in, in birth. As far as exercise, you want to be in as good physical shape as you can before you get pregnant. You want to have an established exercise routine, whether it's just walking a little bit or if it's doing some more vigorous sorts of exercise before you can conceive. The better shape that you are in, the better the outcome of your pregnancy is going to be. And then when you become pregnant, you would continue exercise, moderate exercise, and this is where you would confer with some healthcare uh, professional to help guide you. But exercise during pregnancy is definitely beneficial. It's beneficial to the mother and to the fetus and baby. It's also really going to help during the period of uh, delivery and carrying that baby during the last three months of pregnancy especially. But I'm going to be talking about the physical, nutritional, and medicinal issues that are related to preparing for pregnancy, and then in the very early uh, pregnancy period. Now, the first time that a woman would generally recognize that she was even pregnant, this is where um, she would have the first inkling that she's missing a period. So we have at least 14 days here where a woman can be pregnant and not even have a clue. This 14 days can be very, very, very important because women often are taking medications. They're often doing physical things that may not be good for them in early stages of pregnancy. And so by being aware prior to even trying to conceive, you are setting yourself up for the best possible outcome for your pregnancy. As far as uh, nutrition, people need to have a very nutritious diet in the pre-pregnancy period before conception because this is where you're going to be set, setting yourself up with the habits that you will need to carry yourself through pregnancy and to make sure that the fetus and the baby later on will be uh, receive all the nutrition that they need. We need basically three things in our nutrition. We need carbohydrates, we need protein, and we need fats. One of the things people, people don't realize, a lot of women, we definitely need fats in our diet. And of course, I'm not excluding uh, fiber and those sorts of things, but they're the three main components. And when I'm talking about fats, I'm not talking about Taco Bell or uh, McDonald sorts of fats. I'm talking about the unsaturated fats, especially the omega-3s. Folic acid, this is one of the most important nutrients for a woman to have during the pre-pregnancy period. Why do we say that? Because we don't know often when one is pregnant. There's this period um, where the um, spinal cord is developing and the brain, where it is very vulnerable to problems. Spina bifida is one of the problems that develops. This is where you have the open spinal column and it can go all the way up and into the brain also, depending on the severity. But this is prevented in most part by having sufficient folic acid on board. The minimum recommendation now is for 400 micrograms of folic acid in the pre pregnancy period. Uh, and this is generally attained via supplementation. 
people can get sufficient folic acid in their diet if they eat well. The majority of Americans, and I would say 99.9%, .9 do not eat properly. The other problem with the natural folic acid is it is harder for the system to absorb that than the folic acid that we get in nutritional supplements. So today it is recommended that all women who are in the um, who are able to conceive and have children, uh, whether they are on contraceptives or not, to make sure that they are receiving at least 400 micrograms of the folic acid a day. Many um, physicians and other health care providers will recommend if you are trying to get pregnant that you should be taking a minimum of 600 uh, micrograms a day. All adults are recommended to be taking a multivitamin, multimineral. This is a major about face um, from the medical community within the last year because it is realized that our food source is somewhat compromised. We don't know how long the foods are in the store before we get them, and of course the quality degrades with time. Um, we don't know necessarily how the foods are grown. So in most cases, we're not necessarily getting all of the nutrients that we think we are, even when we are doing a very good job about eating properly and getting all of the things that we, that we should have. Um, again, critical period for development is the first few weeks after uh, conception. And this is why, again, we start thinking about things, becoming very conscious before we even start trying to conceive so we don't have any problems, so we're not rushing to some health care provider and say, what do I do now? I did X, Y, and Z, um, and I didn't know I was pregnant. Uh, as far as other things to avoid, you want to get caffeine out of your life as much as possible. Do it in the pre-pregnancy uh, period so you don't have to worry about going cold turkey once you do find out that you're uh, pregnant. Now again, probably just a little bit of caffeine isn't going to cause any harm. But again, caffeine is truly a drug. Get it out of your life. Alcohol is one that you should also get out of your life. Alcohol certainly is linked to a lot of malformations. We've all heard about fetal alcohol syndrome. It's a very serious thing, and it is best to get that under control before you start uh, conceiving. The m male partner here also has a responsibility as far as alcohol consumption, um, caffeine consumption if it's in excess, and certainly with um, the use of tobacco products, uh, especially cigarette smoking. Uh, alcohol consumption, especially cigarette consumption um, by the, the male and by the, the mother are associated with all sorts of problems um, for the child. I've been talking mostly about congenital malformations, birth defects, but we also have to think about how well does the fetus grow. It, it's not just one thing happening and then another thing and then another thing. This is all an ongoing process and certainly with brain development it goes on long after the child is, is born. Uh, another thing to think about is um, some of the foods that we eat, raw seafood, um, soft cheeses, brie and camembert, pate, raw or undercooked meat or poultry. These can all contain bacteria, which um, can be very damaging to a fetus. Um, and you don't necessarily know if you're carrying these bacteria when uh, you conceive. So the best thing is to again, clean up your act um, in advance.
and um, vegetarians, usually there's no problem if you are a vegetarian who is willing to take um, some egg or, or maybe a little bit of fish or something, but if you are a vegan or a lacto-vegetarian, uh, you definitely need help with your diet. You would need to be on supplementation because you will not have uh, sufficient nutrients to properly carry um, the pregnancy. One of the big things we don't think about is vitamin A. I don't know how many of you have heard that vitamin A is considered a teratogen. It's something that causes birth defects. This was in the news a number of years ago, especially with the Retin-A treatments, and now um, there are black box warnings on the, um, any of the products that are given by prescription uh, to women. The, the black box is there for everyone to see, but it's a concern for women of childbearing ages. Um, it causes all sorts of congenital malformations. It's very dangerous. Um, no more than 5,000 interna international units of vitamin A should be taken um, prior to conception or during the total uh, pregnancy. So I started making my own products. I, um, oh. I've been an herbalist for years. It's been my hobby for years and years. And uh, I also love birth. And I got pregnant myself. I did midwifery training and did all this training and then got pregnant myself and started making my own products. Well, the midwife that I used started really finding out and loving these products, wanted to carry them in her office. So we started doing that. And slowly but surely, it's just kind of blossomed into this nationwide business. And we support and supply all kinds of midwives, um, healthcare providers, lactation consultants, birth resource centers, and individual people with uh, the herbal products that they need for their, their care through their childbearing years. Well, we have about 250 products, and we make them all in here. Um, the teas comprise um, a portion of them. We have a pregnancy tea, a pregnancy tea for the last six weeks of um, pregnancy, called Pregnancy Tea Plus. <clears throat> we have a breastfeeding tea that we, right now, call nursing tea. Um, we have some postpartum sitz bath herbs for uh, use right after the birth to help heal and soothe the perineal area. We have a relaxation tea. We have a tea for the tummy, called tummy tea right now. We're trying mm -hmm. to think of some more inventive names for these things. Preconception tea. Preconception tea to help with fertility, yeah. yeah. So these are all of our tinctures. These are all of our tinctured herbs and some oils. It's cold in here right now, so they're all kind of hard. But um, these are, we have regular alcohol-based, which you, for some herbs you need the strength of alcohol to extract the medicinal properties. Then we have um, some of our combinations nausea relief for morning sickness, iron tonic for anemia, um, the pregnancy tea, it also comes in a liquid. Uh, there's the labor tincture. And what is pregnancy tea? It is a nutritive tea or tincture that uh, a woman can take through her pregnancy to help tone and strengthen the uterus, to help prepare it for the work of labor and birth and help speed mm -hmm. postpartum recovery. And it's also loaded with vitamins and minerals that are necessary for mom and growing baby, calcium, iron, things of that nature. Um, really nutritive. <clears throat> and um, now this is my pregnancy tea I'm talking about. You know, other people have other combinations. This um, is your version. This is my version, yeah. Next month, I'm speaking to the lactation consultants over at Kaiser in San Francisco. I'm starting to work with them. Wow, that's a good opportunity. Yeah, isn't that great? Yeah. And um, it was so nice. Um, I spoke with them last week, and they had a woman who had a very deep, deep plug in her breast. <clears throat> they tried to aspirate it and do all these awful things and couldn't get anything out of it, and they were going to send her to the surgeon. Okay. And uh, so they called me, you know, one last 
one last thing before sending her to the surgeon, and I told him about an herb to um, help clear that out and where they could get it. Fortunately, there was a place not far from them. They could just send the woman down there, and uh, she was greatly improved by the next day. So that, mm. that feels good. I conducted some research with peers of mothers and children, hypnotizing them independently and asking them in detail about the same birth. When Dr. Chamberlain first asked us to participate in uh, this study, he first asked if we had discussed Linda's birth to any extent, which uh, neither of us had any memory of this. So at that point he asked that we do not discuss it at all. And uh, when he took us in for hypnosis, he did it separately. First I went in and he recorded the session, and then Linda went in separately and she was recorded. It's kind of neat that we ended up sharing an experience that I thought was only mine. And it ended up to be both our experiences. And uh, that is important to me. I guess in that way you could say that we're closer, even though that we've already been close. Um, another thing it did for me was to reinforce my own feelings of parenting in that I feel that each individual has an inner wisdom for their own direction and our job as a parent is to help each individual find that for himself, not for us to fit them in a mold. And this reinforced that in showing how much wisdom, how much knowledge, how much awareness there really is even in a newborn infant. All right, I had a lot of questions about the validity of hypnosis myself and mm -hmm. how much really happened and how much maybe we made up without meaning to. Mm -hmm. And uh, in looking over the transcripts, Linda had remembered something cold and hard about her head during the birth process. And in looking over the transcript that I said under hypnosis, I never mentioned that. And yet I remembered in my normal state that forceps had been used. And this really impressed me that uh, the reason I didn't remember it was because I was under hypnosis was remembering it as it occurred to me as I was aware of it and I found out about the uh, forceps later from the doctor but I didn't know it at the time so it's kind of interesting she knew more what was going on than I did when I was in the fetus I remember different before the labor or anything I remember things like I remember feelings that she had if she was relaxed I would feel really good and sometimes she would like talk to me or something I could feel her trying to communicate with me and that felt really good and if she was upset about something I would be tense and during the birth during the labor during the contractions I would tighten up really t tighten up when she was tightening up and then I would relax and it was like I was helping I knew what to do or it was more automatic actually but I was really upset with the doctor when he started trying to pull me out I was mad I was very angry, and I wanted to do it by myself, and I knew I could, and I felt like saying, Doctor, you're messing it up, just get away. One thing that was really interesting was that um, after I was born, they set me on her stomach, and I looked at her, and I knew I wanted to stay with her, and I looked at her, and I knew, as soon as my eyes hit her eyes, I knew that there wasn't anything she was going to do about it, that I wasn't going to be able to stay with her. And as soon as I realized that, I just accepted it that I was going to be taken away. But I, the second I saw her face, I knew that. And this is kind of interesting because she really read me. At that point, I was not the kind of person that would do anything to change the way things were. You know, I would just automatically go along with whatever was said. This is the way it is. Okay, that's fine with me. And it seemed like she picked this up as a newborn looking at me. And I tried to tell her with my mind. I looked at her, wanting to tell her, keep me with you. But as soon as I saw her, then I knew that it was hopeless. <laughs> A very, something that's very important to me is that I 
can use this when I have children. I'll remember what it's like to be inside my mother's stomach. I'll know how they're feeling, and I'll know how they feel when they're born, and I'll know that they understand me as, at least as much as I understand them. You don't have to listen to many of these reports very long before you are aware of a very impressive intelligence at work. The babies seem to know better what they need and what's going on than some of the adults around them. I was surprised at how wise I actually was when I was born. When I was born, I felt like I do now. But because of society, not so much my parents, but mostly just society in general, they program you that you're small, you're not bright, you're just a little kid, you don't know anything. And I actually became a little kid as I grew up. I was like a wise person. I felt like an adult till I was about three, and then I became a child and grew up again. And I remember that. I remember being small, looking up at people, and feeling wiser than them because they didn't know that I understood what was going on, and they thought I was some stupid little... Your sweet, sweet lips, your perfect nose, your rosy cheeks, your ten little toes, your precious little pee-pee, your wondrous sighs, your tender bottom, your pink chubby thighs. We've waited so long for you to come. I'm your dad. Perfectly perfect 